G'day everybody, and to everybody wherever you are, other parts of Perth or across the state, I don't know where you are. Um, we're going to talk about technology and fall prevention. And it seemed a really good idea at the time, but I don't know whether it actually evolved into a good idea. Because once I started looking, it sort of like became obvious that this was an absolutely massive area, and we're sort of like at the tip of the iceberg at the moment. And because of that, there's this explosion of kind of like literature and websites and information and probably every biomedical school around the world is probably doing some kind of um, study into this area. But um, when we're thinking about technology and falls prevention, um, we can really probably divide it into a couple of areas. Technology that's reactive or proactive. So reactive, we're really thinking about patient safety, patient monitoring, as opposed to being proactive where, yes, we're monitoring but what we, we might try and do is actually implement interventions based on what we're seeing with, with um, the technology. Now, much of when we're talking about technology, it is very much around ICT, computerised based technology. But technology isn't just about that, and there are some other examples of it. Um, and one of the things that's really important is that technology alone doesn't prevent falls. Without staff and human interaction, both the patient and the healthcare professional, technology is really useless. So, it needs to be interactive with um, all of that. Um, part of the interest or the stimulus to maybe look at technology in falls came from the Falls Prevention Conference that was um, in Sydney last year. And not that there was a massive kind of content about technology, but there was a few little things which were probably more so than in previous years. There was an excellent um, plenary presentation on residential aged care and a Canadian professor where they've been using video technology to actually assess um, patient falls within common areas. And they brought up some really interesting results based on the mechanisms of falls, um, how what actually happened in a fall, less than 50% of the time didn't actually correlate with how we reported falls, based because very often you don't have a history. So there was some really interesting information about that. There was uh, another plenary on motion sensors, um, looking at gait analysis, the use of virtual reality for treadmill training and, and hazard avoidance. Um, one study, which is a multinational study, which I'll go um, through a little bit later, the iStop Falls, which is using a quite a complex information communication technology system to prevent and detect falls um, for people at home. Um, the use of virtual reality as well for flooring surfaces, um, older adults and exercise gaming, low impact flooring not thought as a technological innovation, but it is in terms of the design that's um, in, in that. And other things in terms of perspectives of healthcare professionals to the use of technology for fall prevention and detection. If we look at a lot of the evidence around falls um, as it currently stands, technology and innovation has actually pervaded this area as well. If we think about psychoactive medications, we know that they're a problem in terms of falls. Over you know, a number of years, we've actually had significant improvements within the pharmaceutical, of pharmaceutical industry in terms of developing antidepressants and psychoactive medications that have a better risk profile. That hasn't necessarily translated to a reduction in falls, however, or um, a lower falls risk associated with these medications. Vitamin D has been a <coughs> relatively new supplement which has developed over time, which has enabled it to get out to a, a much wider range of people. And in some countries, they use really high doses, so different forms of um, vitamin D, which they can give to people maybe once a month or once every few months. Um, so it makes it easier in terms of getting that medication into them. <coughs> Multifocals are a technological innovation in terms of eyewear. It doesn't work for falls, but because we know that for people who are regular outdoor walk walkers, multifocals and bifocals actually increase the risk of falls in those people. Expedited cataract surgery. Probably they didn't think about the benefits of cataract when they developed cataract surgery all those years ago and that wonderful, amazing, amazing thing in terms of helping people to see. Little did they know that they would have a very powerful intervention in terms of preventing falls down the track. If we think about in hospital kind of life setting, um, there was a um, presentation here delivered last year by Anne Marie Hill. Um, I think it was, was the last presentation of the year. And we know, for instance, that um, there's been a, a number of presentations and a number of um, research programs based around DVD education with health professional um, kind of like follow-up and facilitation of that education. And the DVD technology in itself is really probably not the most important component of that, but what technology has, does allow us to do, hopefully in the future, is to deliver interventions in a slightly different way. And hopefully that might help us to be more successful with how we do interventions. Um, vitamin D, 
Hip protectors, they actually have evolved from hard shell to soft shell, but we haven't necessarily seen the benefits in those in terms of maybe um, certain like from falls, and they can prevent fracture, but they don't always work because of other issues. So, technology, does it have a role? Well, it does. It can help us to understand falls mechanisms, help with patient assessment depending on what aspect of technology we're using. <coughs> it helps us to deliver nine falls interventions, so exa games, for instance, that we'll talk about a little bit later. So the use of um, video games to do exercises at home is a method of delivering an intervention. The big thing is really around patient monitoring. That's where a lot of the kind of like literature and um, the, the evidence is coming out of, coming out as well now. And also healthcare professional education, which is something which um, I've got a bit of a focus on through some work that I've done with um, Curtin and um, Uni. Technology, the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry. And you know, healthcare is absolutely no different in terms of this. So when we think of technology and fall prevention, we think a lot of the terminology that we see, they're all kind of like very computerish, as I like to call it. And I'll use that term because I don't know much about technology, I'm not very computer savvy. But all of these kind of like terms, you know, telecare, telehealth, video, video conference, the use of video conferences and technology today has been really beneficial because hopefully, you know, at sites where people can't come in, they might get a little bit of information that might be of value based on today's um, lecture. But all, all of these terms come up when we're thinking about technology. So there's lots of different aspects of technology in terms of fault prevention. But it's not just about that kind of like fancy ICT stuff. A definition of technology going back to the 1930s um, includes all tools, machines, utensils, weapons, instruments, housing, clothing, communicating and transporting devices and the skills by which we use and produce, produce and use them. So technology is not just about the device but it's about what goes in, what comes out and how we implement that into our kind of like organisation or into our society. In its simplest form, technology is tools and machines to solve real world problems. Okay, but technology in itself is not the, you know, it's not always, it brings some problems with it, okay? We can't just implement something without generally having some guidelines or some rules about use, or we might not necessarily think that something happens initially when we've designed that technology, but later on down the track, something may well actually evolve and we then have to problem solve about it. The reason I put this up is as I was having a final read today, we had this email come out which obviously goes to all of health. And technology obviously has a little bit of an issue because if we have technology that is always based on ICT, do we have fallback mechanisms where potentially something goes wrong? So there are a few apps which at some places, you know, so I was getting a bit worried, I was thinking, I hope YouTube isn't affected by this because I've got some YouTube videos for today. So fortunately that's not, that seems to be working. But you know, we need to make sure that we've got contingency plans when we do have technology because that could be a bit of an issue. Right, you might be thinking, walking stick, where does technology come into that? Well, remember that definition about you know, tools, machinery? Well, walking stick is a, a tool for balance. And that has undergone some technological innovation over time. So the walking stick as we currently know it today developed around the 17th to 18th century and it developed as a fashion item. Men no longer had to carry swords, so they had a walking stick that was developed. You know? It has evolved a little bit, looking at it. You know, tim a lot of people still have timber walking sticks. A lot of people have these metal ones, adjustable. They've got a handle, different kinds of, um, maybe like a little wrist attachment, and ergonomic handles, and a rubber ferrule. You know, so it hasn't really changed very much in its simplest form. Simple, works really well, helps with balance. How did that walking stick evolve over time? We've got to go back to the caveman. The caveman had dual purposes in terms of walking sticks. They needed to cover really rough terrain, so they needed something to give them support. But during that time, there would have been wild beasts trying to attack them. So, you know, having a spear on the other end meant it was dual purpose. Go forward many thousands of years to the shepherd. Shepherding or sheep can sort of like, they can cover really rough terrain when they're going looking for food as opposed to cows and other animals. So they could go up into the mountains and along tracks, which meant it was very hazardous for shepherds doing their work. So they needed a support. But sheep, being the inquisitive animals that they are, would get caught in things and get trapped. So the hook was developed to actually help them to actually pull the sheep out or to help them, you know, get legs which were entrapped and to bring them out. So 
Um, that was why that developed, so there was a little bit of an innovation there. Move forward to Robbie Coltrane, James <coughs> Bond movie, The World Is Not Enough. Walking stick gun. <laughs> okay? That actually wasn't developed in the 90s. That was developed in about the 1850s. <laughs> Remington actually started to manufacture these. So the walking stick gun and the weapons associated with walking sticks, there was also sword sticks around the time, you know, were, were quite common during that, during that period. Coming up to more conventional walking sticks these days that we've, I, I have actually have found while I was searching for this, and this is a, a beauty, this kind of like brand of walking stick. They've got a magnetic handle, so you can pick up keys. It's got a little, basically a magnetic handle. Um, it's got a little light. They've both got little lights there, so you can light up the way. Um, you can plug it in and charge it up. But if it runs out, on this model here in particular, you can open that little handle there. So see this little bit here, open it up, and you wind it up, and you actually self-charge it while you're going. Always good for those long walks at night time. Okay? Radio. Because you never know, you like to listen to the radio going for a walk. Even got a USB port. Don't know what you'd need a USB port for, but you've got one. So you can see technological innovation has happened within the walking stick as well. Then we get to things like this one here, which is actually a really interesting um, walking stick design, which actually has been used to assess gait. It's a walking stick that actually has built-in pressure sensors in the base and in the handle as well as accelerometers and gyroscopes within the base of it, which actually help to assess the use of the walking stick as the person is walking. So for instance, if that technology could be implemented into more conventional walking sticks and came down at a cheaper price, it does actually help therapists in terms of assessing gait, assessing how patients may be struggling or are using their walking stick, are they using it at the right kind of like position, that kind of thing. So walking stick does have technological evolution. Back in the 1850s, they also developed an exercise chair to help the invalid who couldn't exercise. So they were thinking about home-based exercise back then. <laughs> no Otago for them. But the best invention relating or technology that has been developed relating to falls prevention, and it remains to this day, in my opinion, is the humble light. <laughs> okay? Lighting help balance, helps balance no ends. And for people who work within a home environment, and I'm sure there's many, people still don't turn the light on at night when they go to the toilet. So that is still a big issue for us. So if we can get people to turn the light on, that would be a really good thing. But given that we can't in many situations, how are we gonna get people to use some of the more pervasive technology that we're, is actually coming out at the moment? So this represents a hospital bed of the future, which I was able to find on the net. It's a really kind of like, definitely not Charlie's in, two, in a few years time, I haven't been fortunate enough to go into uh, Fiona Stanley, so I don't actually know what that looks like, but I suspect it probably wouldn't look exactly like that, but it probably does look nice and white in certain areas. But, you know, really, hospitals are challenging the environments for new information technologies, particularly when you think about retrospective kind of like fitting of many hospitals. I mean, many hospitals, like Charlie's, have been around for a long time. New technologies, they might not actually fit some of the physical infrastructure. You know, these hospital environments have built-in sensors everywhere. Um, you can aim this example here, you can access medical documentation wherever you are within the room, you know, touching on a particular wall. There's sensors which monitor and they come up on large screens. So it's very easy to get information about the patient and also to monitor the patient. But with technologies, we have non-standard design of hospitals, a complex flow of people and equipment. So, you know, we think about trying to implement some of these technologies, but it doesn't necessarily go, you know, it's, it's complicated, it's not just easy. And there's also organisational culture which might limit the application of technologies. If you think about the hospital bed and how that's evolved, hospital beds were generally fixed, you know, <coughs> fixed height, unadjustable, no bed rails. Okay? And they've evolved into um, complex devices which are tiltable, you know, they can got um, split bed rails, um, all of the components of the bed can be adjusted, and some beds also go right down to the floor. Has, has, it, has this actually necessarily improved patient safety? Well, not necessarily. Um, a US report through the um, Food and Drug Administration showed that um, bed rails are a significant cause of entrapment and falls from a height. So um, some of these studies that have shown in the US from 1985 to 2013, 531 deaths related to bed rails due to both entrapment and falls. And within a home environment, because people do use bed rails at home, 
was about 155 deaths over a similar period. But what was really interesting about that is that they had 37,000 ED presentations due to bed rails over that period, which was just a staggering amount. So, um, you know, bed rail design has evolved and like, but it still doesn't necessarily mean that it's become any safer. But what do we do? We have, go and have use other bedside technology such as bed exit alarms. What we do know is that alarms are not a substitute for staff, unfortunately. Um, adequate staff availability is still necessary when residents need or wish to exit from the bed. So bed rail alarms actually act as an adjunct to what we do. They shouldn't be seen as a solution for issues. But there has been a lot of work on bed exit alarms. Um, certainly the reduction in restraint and the reduction in bed rail use has probably seen an increase in the use of bed exit alarms. The evidence around them is quite inconclusive at the moment. A Crocodile review from 2002 didn't have any evidence either way saying it increases or decreases falls rates. Um, it wasn't conclusive, um, didn't seem to make it worse, but not necessarily evidence that it made it better. There are multiple or there are different systems, some which use a single sensor such as a pressure device and others which use multiple sensors, so maybe a pressure device and an infrared lamp or ray which sort of like detects a person moving. The systems which use multiple um, sensors are reported to reduce um, false alarms because that is one of the problems of some bed exit systems. So different kinds, floor bed chairs, sensors can be also attached to cord to their clothing. Um, there's also motion detectors. Um, but they do bring with them certain problems depending on the patient weight, patient agitation, so they might create false alarms and that then creates problems. There are lots of future developments in the wings and that's where there's a lot of work going on such as wireless wearable sensors and technology which is actually room based so nothing needs to be worn on the person whatsoever or nothing obtrusive needs to be worn on the person whatsoever but it can monitor them for a distance and it covers the whole room rather than necessarily just their bed or their chair where they're exiting from. Um, some of the issues around this also include um, so staff acceptance of technology um, for use of bed alarms are they easy to use and can they be integrated into current systems? Um, the risk of desensitisation with false alarms is a real concern. Um, we might over rely on them. And also the investigations um, with regards to bed exit alarms, some of the, the studies have not been very good in terms of their effectiveness or not. So they might actually be effective, but the studies necessarily haven't shown that. One of the emerging technologies relates to real-time location um, or indoor positioning systems. Now generally this is a system where you would have an electronic tag on a piece of equipment generally and you'd be able to monitor the location of that equipment anywhere within an organisation or a hospital in particular. So it's good for tracking devices that are expensive. Patients are not expensive but you know they're pretty precious. So um, they've proposed that you could use some kind of tagging system that you could use on a patient to actually monitor their movements and you know if you were worried about wandering patients that they were maybe going to get lost. But in terms of falls prevention, so there's a variety of different technologies and one that's come out of, um, it's, uh, it's been studied by a group I think in South Australia, is the use of radio frequency identification. So they utilise as a really small kind of like technological kind of, it's like a, a credit card I think in terms of size, it's low cost, so about a dollar can be mass produced, um, wearable, very unobtrusive. And they've done some pilots on that where the technology that they've used, they've been able to so essentially the person's wearing it, there's antennas in the room or within the corridor and based on the computerised algorithms that they develop that can monitor where they're going or what they're doing. So they've done a pilot which identi correctly identifies things like getting in and out of bed, up and down from a chair, walking with or without a walking aid. You know, Mrs Smith who always chills off without a walking stick. That would then send a message to, uh, or sends a signal to a computer which analyses the information then sends a signal back to the um, staff's pager that it gives the person an alert that you know Mrs Smith is on the move. So this is an emerging technology which might be good and there's a, apparently like a study going on I think somewhere in South Australia at one of the hospitals with the university on its application within a GEM unit in pertaining to falls. So this is the kind of thing which you know potentially could be a technology that we see down the track you know if it works. Could we have saved Humpty? Well, apparently we could have if we had low impact flooring. Um, 
Flooring innovations within hospital settings, you know, are a really interesting thing. And again, it's a retrofit kind of situation, so possibly their acceptance can be a little bit of an issue. We know that softer surfaces such as carpet and vinyl do absorb the impact of a fall um, better than a hard floor. However, depending on the degree of compliance of the floor, it can affect the person's postural stability. So they've developed these safety or compliant falls which reduce, are said to reduce the impact of a fall when you fall sideways. They basically all have slightly different technologies, they have their obviously their own product, but it's very much aero bar kind of like stuff. So they're all kind of like some kind of like special device foam and it's got like some bubble of air, okay, and then on impact it disperses and it helps people to prevent or reduces injury. Going back to the Humpty Dumpty story, the theory was is that if you reduce the impact of a falling egg by 35% using this low impact floor, Humpty would have been okay. <laughs> um, there's been a review into a number of commercially available products, all tend to reduce the force, but only some of them have an effect or don't impact on postural sway, so they don't make balance worse. Because that's a really critical thing when you're actually thinking about patients in terms of how they mobilise. We don't want to necessarily increase the risk of a fall. A pilot study in the UK um, by Drahoda of one of their substances that they've used, it showed an increased, re increased number of fallers, but a reduction in falls injuries for their particular product that they were testing at the time. And there is a large clinical trial which is happening in Canada. This is one example of, I think it's called Smart Cell, and again, it's just showing that kind of like air kind of like phenomenon where the floor's in its resting state. So when you're walking on it, it's firm. When you land on it, it compresses, um, and absorbs the impact. One of the issues from a staffing point of view of low impact flooring is the pushing of trolleys and beds, and that potentially could be like a barrier to use in some kind of like facilities, depending on patient method. Yes? Is that gonna work better, the heavier, is there gonna be a weight where it doesn't work at? There actually, in, no, interesting, there actually was, and I didn't actually get around to it, but there was something around flooring, using this compliant flooring and BMI. Yep. So I've got that article, but I didn't actually get around to reading oh, that one. But actually, that's a really good question, because yeah, you'd wonder. You're gonna to have to have a defamation. Level, yeah, I suppose the issue is that if a, a larger person, you do actually have more protection generally anyway, yeah. inbuilt, so you've got two inbuilt kind of like, you know, one in the patient, one in the floor, but you yeah, know, there actually there is some... I'm a smaller person. Oh, it's so not, yes. The floor's not going to... Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Early. I said, I don't know what the actual yeah. results of that article was, but yeah, really good question. Um, coming on to the other form is hip protectors, for instance. So we know they've evolved from hard shell to soft shell. We know that all of the brands that are commercially available, they do tend to attenuate the force to below the fracture threshold. But because there's other issues other than just wearing them, it's, like, or it's around compliance, usability, getting them on and off, it might not necessarily be the technology per se that doesn't work, but the other issues associated with implementing the technology, that is more of a problem. Helmets have actually improved. It was only a few years ago when um, the company that makes this helmet here just made this foam thing which they haven't actually done any impact testing on. They've now developed a, a cushion which actually does reduce the impact, you know, when they're wearing it. It still doesn't ad, you know, advocate or mean that we can't, use, we shouldn't use post-fall procedures for unwitnessed falls if a person's wearing this, but it does provide a little bit of greater protection. We've got a little bit of evidence about it in terms of the potential impact. In the future, we'll probably develop it even further. Floor transfer devices which are used on the wards help in terms of removing the fallen patient. So that's beneficial. Um, the ELF is a very similar to the hobby jack and it's meant to be used for home use. And the only problem is that it's really expensive. So from a practical point of view, it's difficult for most people to be able to actually purchase this. Comes to that kind of like technology that we use within a home environment, so telecare and telehealth, and this is really applicable for older adults at risk of falls. And this incorporates a number of things like remote position, um, remote position monitoring, or remote patient monitoring, ambient assisted living. There's lots of terminology which sort of like comes in this telecare, telecare, telehealth kind of like realm. So telecare is the support and assistance that we provide at a distance using information communication technology. Telehealth, a little, a little bit more detail, is the remote exchange of data between a person at home and their clinician or their healthcare professional at a distant site, which assists in diagnosis and monitoring. So usually that is focused around chronic diseases, but there is also um, the, the detection of gait imbalance. So if people's balance and gait is deteriorating within a home environment or wherever they're living, 
it might mean that they're becoming more at risk of having the fall within that time, so maybe remedial action could be implemented. So this is kind of like the, you know, the, the smart home, and in terms of particularly around patient safety. So in terms of falls, we've got things like falls detectors, which um, monitor whether a person has a fall. So they're, they are available locally through um, various organisations who provide personal alarms. Um, movement detectors, so passive infrared. infrared um, so they monitor people whether they're moving or whether they're immobile. Okay, and they can be programmed, generally programmed, depending on how you want it. So, for instance, if you wanted to detect somebody when they were immobile for a certain length of period, other than night time when they're sleeping, then that might give you an indication that something has happened to that person. Um, pull cords in terms of activating alarms in particular areas, bed chair sensors, pressure mats, all things which potentially could help in terms of the passive monitoring of people when they've fallen. Ambient assisted living, when we're thinking about telecare and telehealth technologies, they often say, it's often described in terms of ambient assisted living, in terms of having systems in place, which are not so obtrusive, but they're actually, they just sort of work in the background. But they're not sort of, you know, so invasive into our homes, so our home has become like a hospital. You know, people want to live at home, they want to be independent at home, but they don't want to live in a hospital. So the devices and things that are used need to support them, but they need to be unobtrusive. Um, these systems need to adapt to changing personal situations over time, and it needs to provide services that are accessible. So if you're going to provide a service that is a safety service, that so when you have a fall, someone's going to come and pick you up, the service needs to be ready and available to be able to do that. Okay, so as we've said before, the technologies around telehealth and telecare often are around chronic disease, but patient safety is the big one, the one that we're focused on. The situ these fund lock systems have a point of care data collection which is at the person's home. They need to transmit that data to some kind of monitoring area or base. That data needs to be stored, collected, it needs to be analysed and then it needs to be fed back to some kind of clinician or person who's going to be delivering some form of care. Now I've got a YouTube video which summarises this perfectly. I hope it works. And I hope there's um, volume. See the movie? Bunbury, can you answer me?
Sorry about that. We didn't realise that wasn't going to come through. Um, there'll be... come through we thought that, that you would be able to get that as well um, so go on to the next thing. so in terms of some of the things which can be used so again with these telecare telehealth systems there are again folks around detection versus prevention so there are falls monitors which are available um, and again so available locally um, they're ones which will monitor people passively if they don't actually activate the alarm uh, the passive infrared sensors here, so again, as I said before, they will detect movement or detect immobility. And they use all use different kind of like algorithms to basically determine if an incident occurs. There's a many watch which came out, I think, this year. I saw it in the in the paper and then it was ended up on ILC website. But again, simple watch, similar features to a phone, it's got a duress alarm, it's got a GPS monitor, so people can use it if they do fall at home. But even if they were to get lost out, it would have capacity in terms of being able to find them within a few metres. Prevention, as we spoke about before, would use things like um, sensors either attached to the patient or to the equipment to monitor their movement and detect whether there's been any deterioration within that. Um, we can skip that. So in terms of some of the issues with remote um, patient monitoring, ambient assistance, living telecare and things, that the person really needs to be motivated and willing to engage. It becomes a bit of an issue when you've got a client who's got maybe cognitive impairment. So there we need a different type of technology and that's where the passive technologies potentially can actually work quite well. Cost can be a barrier to some of these systems, particularly now that they're getting set up because they require quite a bit of setup costs, you know, in terms of using them. You know, simple pre um, personal care alarm, not so much, but even saying that some of them, if you want to purchase, can be upwards of $600. So potentially can be a bit of a barrier. The technology means that there needs to be response guidelines. So for systems that are monitoring continuously, if they create false positives, how many times do we respond? So we need to have a system in place that means that we respond appropriately when it really is a critical incident. There's continuous data flow with these systems that monitor continuously, so that potentially could create increased workload. There's issues around patient confidentiality and information security because they're being transmitted wirelessly in many situations. And they need extensive infrastructure, which, you know, for instance, the NBN might potentially be able to provide us in terms of actually developing that. But when that arrives, and to all parts of Australia, because people live everywhere, you know, that's another story. The iStop Falls is one program, it's a multinational research study, which is looking at a kind of system which is looking at um, home-based monitoring and performance of exercise interventions. So. If we just focus on the next page here, it shows the kind of like complexity, this is from the protocol um, for the study, it shows the kind of complexity setting up in terms of like these home-based systems. So, for instance, there's a, a monitor which is developed, the research group has developed, which monitors their performance as well as when they're exercising, it monitors the quality of their exercise. Um, this all feeds into a central computer. You need a TV, you need a set-top box because you can do your exercises through Google TV. There's a Microsoft Connect which monitors the person's performance during the activity as well. So all of these technologies, they're reasonably kind of like complicated, but they're all sensing and providing interventions at home. And then that needs to be fed to other aspects to actually get feedback and things and to monitor it. So quite a complicated system, but as these technologies evolve and develop, you know, potentially they'll become cheaper, they'll become more easy to use. And this is one that you're actually doing the study at the moment, and hopefully there'll be um, some beneficial effects in terms of falls and things. So that looks like a really nice little program there. This is another large study which is done, again, in Europe. So Europe is really big on these electronic monitoring um, things. So again, multinational project looking at pre predicting, identifying, and preventing falls with information communication technologies multiple components to it, a lot around the development of technologies which monitor patients. But they've also developed, um, done a systematic review which looked at the older adult acceptance of these technologies. 
And there was a couple of emerging themes. One, that um, people want choice and control over the technology and the kind of technology that's used. There needs to be benefits to the individual, because otherwise that's going to be like, um, you're not going to uptake it. It needs to be usable, needs to be relatively cheap as well. And that different technologies have different attitudes. Some of the technologies which have been um, researched include video analysis within a person's home. Not very good in terms of privacy. You know, even things which monitor continuous activity. I mean, people want to do things and not necessarily be able to, or have to tell everybody else about it or have other people know what they're doing at a particular time. That might just be private time for them. So there are lots of issues around some of this monitoring of, of clients. Um, they have released guidelines in terms of the implementation of technologies and they're focused around usability and design, personal motivations and promoting new technology for actual people trying to develop the technology. So this is a really useful stuff which um, you know, might be beneficial for people going forward when they're developing it. Walking frames. Walking frames have also developed in terms of technology. Okay? Um, I'm being serious, maybe not so much these ones, but you know, physios and, and other health professionals are commonly prescribing walking aids. Walking frames are really critical. Um, there's lots of different kinds of um, devices out there. But this one here actually does have a technological innovation. So this is a really fancy four-wheeled seat walker. And one of the interesting design features of this one here is that it's got a dual axle wheel. So one of the problems that we have as clinicians is getting people to use seat walkers and zimmer frames going up curves and steps. Quite hazardous, particularly if they fall back. This design here, for instance, potentially might alleviate that in the future. This is available in Europe, quite expensive. It's about 800 and something euros, so you always the money for a bike. Um, but it can actually go on really uneven terrain. Um, you know, it's muddy terrain, tracks and things. But that kind of like technology there will probably evolve down the track into being more accessible on other walking devices which are more accessible for the wider population. So that's a, a really good thing. What about mobile technology? So there's lots of apps which have sort of been around, which have been developed around falls. Some related to assessment, so fear of falling for instance is an app which you can get, Tenetti um, assessment tool. Igeriatrics, which is not which is basically just an information best practice guidelines on falls prevention. It's a lovely little app that gives you information about it. Um, for those interested in assessing executive functioning, there's a trial making test app which is available. And also for vision assessments, you can use the app uh, Apple to test low contrast sensitivity, so the ability to discriminate edges. But these are widely accessible on, on the app store. Um, one of the really nice ones which um, looks like it's relatively new, is this one here called Fall Prevention Evidence in Motion. Now this is a great one in terms of, for people particularly who don't maybe have a lot of experience in falls, so it's great for like GPs and that kind of thing. It really links into lots of evidence-based interventions, so it was based on the STEADY tool which was developed from AGS, BGS guidelines on falls prevention. What's really good about it is that it um, is a really simple screening it provides instructional videos for things like the tug, sit to stand or balance test if a person doesn't know how to do that, like a, a healthcare professional. But then it links into really good web pages which have information on education, but also on how to, on particular evidence-based interventions. And these are really good single interventions like the Otago or stepping on, or multifactorial assessments and how to perform them. So it's a really fantastic little app in terms of very simple, very quick to use. For instance, the one which links into the Otago, you are then able to access, once you go through that pathway, a little video which gives you a... Ooh, back. Well, hopefully you'll be able to see this, a little video which actually shows somebody performing a, um, an exercise at home. So these exercises, are, these videos are available, so there's no reason why clinicians and physios out there, or whoever else is delivering exercise programs, could it be using these to maybe give a visual demonstration to a client who's maybe struggling to actually see that exercise? But this information is all you know, widely available, um, and they've really got good videos and things. Um, and some of the things is also, is that you don't like how they're doing the exercise within the video, it also acts as a learning opportunity for you, or you can teach your client, say, I don't want you to do it this way, for instance. So there's lots of good information out there which is available and accessible. Okay, people have also been using their smartphone, 
well, they've developed apps using a smartphone to actually assess gait. So um, this is one, this was the research app, um, so it hasn't gone into like wide use, but there have been things which have evolved from this using a similar kind of concept where a person places their Samsung smartphone on their waist, they walk up the room and walk back. That sends a message down to a monitoring system and it provides an analysis of their gait. It uses really complex kind of like um, computerized algorithms to determine what's happening within the accelerometers and sensors within the phone to convert that into a gait pattern. Okay? But what's really great about this app is despite the technological advancement of it, they even show you how to make a paper holder for the smartphone. <laughs> I love that. I love that bit about that app. It's just fantastic. <laughs> This other one is another gait analysis app. It works slightly differently. Rather than actually using the device to sense movement, you actually record it with the camera, and then you can play it back through the app, and it actually helps to align joint angles. So again, another really simple kind of like device which that can help in terms of gait assessment for, for us in terms of when we're assessing clients. Balance assessments have evolved. We have, have always had, for many years, had complex um, systems which measure balance. Um, only problem with these, some of these systems here are um, very expensive, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and stuff, so they're not necessarily applicable to the wider population. The development of the Wii board and modifications of the Wii board have seen smaller force platform devices which have been developed and which provide reasonably accurate measurements of patient performance on balance tests. They're transportable, they could be used in a force clinic or a physio practice quite easily. You know, we're thinking just a couple of thousands of dollars here versus hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the technology, it's evolved, but not usually in a more expensive way. It's often come down in terms of being cheaper. An exercise app which, allow, which shows people how to do their exercise. This actually has videos of all the exercises and you can do it along with this lady here, okay? And they're very much Otago-based kind of exercises called I Stand. Um, I won't show this one on YouTube mainly because I don't know, regional areas are not going to get it, or the, the people on the video conference. But again, another dancing app or an exercise game. So people are doing dancing activities with their phone on them, but they can also have it on their TV and be following the TV, the TV instructions through Google TV, so web-based TV. Um, these same people are also developing a screening tool using their phone and very much a walking app based on um, the one that I showed you before. So all technology, which is really, it's all happening now. Um, comes up to Exa Games, which is a really big area. And Exa Games is essentially the use of video games for exercise. Depending on the amount of movement that's required to generate the action in the game, it's whether it's actually a health game or not. So Exa Games for health actually require a significant amount of movement or to actually be classed as a health game. So these ones here, we have commercial games like through Wii Fit and through the Xbox Connect. And again, I won't show the, the YouTube video because I know it won't go through on the video conference. But there are games on there which encourage, about, which do balanced kinds of activities, stepping exercises. There's some which are custom designed. So there's ones which are particularly designed for rehabilitation. So it's called Silver Fit. And then obviously we've got the Ice Stop Falls program which has got its own program which they've developed. And that fancy one which I showed you before. The technologies of these are all based around inertial sensors which detect movement or pressure, or these optical systems which actually, through the Xbox Connect, for instance, it actually takes a 3D kind of like image of where the person is and then feeds that back into the game. So these, all of these games provide direct feedback to the user on their performance. So what are they doing? It? So the theory is, is that people will be more compliant with exercise programs because there's, they're motivated, they're getting direct feedback um, so there's been some studies on these as well, um, and with these games here, so there's been quite a few studies, not all randomised. Of all of the studies, 10 have reported at least one balance measure that has improved using these extra games. And they've been, you know, between 10 and 15, 20% off the balance measure, so whether it's um, Tenetti scale or the Berg balance. Um, one of the interesting things is that all of these devices are actually measuring balance internally, so the actual device is actually measuring balance, but they don't often report that as an outcome. What we do see is high enjoyment and motivation with the clients. Serious games, this is the last bit. 
And this is some of the stuff that I've been um, helping out with at Curtin. So, serious games. They're games which are used for learning, okay, rather than for enjoyment or entertainment, even though they may well be enjoy enjoyable and entertainment. One of the most serious games ever is chess. And this is probably like the best example of a serious game, which was a 1972 World Championship match mm -hmm. between Fisher and Spassky during that kind of like era of the Cold War as it was coming to its end. Very serious, had lots of political undertones between the Soviets and the Americans. So that is a serious game, but it's not the kind of game that we're talking about. However, the history behind serious games is that serious games were not just based around computerised games, they were also based around military strategy. And you could teach military strategy, for instance, by actually getting people to play a board game or something like that. And that was how you could how it evolved. So serious games, a bit of an oxymoron. Serious or not? So this is a game that's been developed um, through Kurt and using a video game design. This is one that we used with some students last year. Looking at performing a virtual home visit by using a video game. Now again, I'm not going to show the YouTube video because I know um, people um, on the link are not going to be able to see it. But there is a link and you'll be able to get it on um, uh, when you get the PDF of the presentation. But essentially what um, happens with this game is that the person, the clinician or the student goes in and they are basically doing a virtual home visit. They're assessing, so they're actually moving through the game. Um, they're going inside the house. They're interviewing the person as well as the carer. They're acquiring knowledge factors about that person's falls risk. They're assessing for environmental risks and they're using that information to then actually develop a risk management plan. So it's really teaching people about how to implement a falls risk management plan on what interventions are you going to do. So serious games are games in which education is the primary goal rather than entertainment. So virtual home visit, acquisition of knowledge, environmental screening, some of the features. It's a customizable script so we can modify the script if we need to, which helps us for instance if um, we want to assess a different scenario. Or for instance, it allows us to assess the user interview skills, so such as empathy and perception. So we can word questions in a particular way, which helps so uh, helps us assess what people are clicking on. So we could have a really um, silly kind of question that you wouldn't ask a patient. So, g'day Mr Smith, how you going? Compared to, you know, a better form of introduction. And depending on which way the person using the game actually clicks, you can then assess, you know, their empathy or their perception or their, their skills in interviewing. So, it allows you to develop quite a number of, number of ways. If you use 3D goggles, which it's been developed for, it becomes completely immersive, so it's actually like walking within the home. Okay, you're not actually moving, but as you're moving through it, it's like it surrounds you. The only problem with that is that I, in particular, when I've used it, get sensor sickness. So motion sickness, but in the opposite sense is that you're not moving, but the sensors are causing this sensory kind of like mismatch. It's a web-based design meaning that it's based on the web, so users access it via the web, and it can be used on lab, um, laptops, tablets, smartphones. So people can bring it anywhere. That's Mr and Mrs Walter, who you would have seen on the video, but you don't see now, so please say hello to them. Um, so they've got these really quite accurate avatars of older people, and they sort of like, they only sort of like, at the moment, they only sort of like move a little bit sway. They don't actually <laughs> walk or anything like that. It hasn't got to that kind of like stage yet. But where does this kind of like technology bring us in terms of fall prevention? So certainly, for instance, is a tool which could be used, say, like in the community care sector. So teaching um, people going out to see people at home, what are some of the things you should be looking out for in terms of falls risk screening? It could be used as a patient education tool, so it could be adapted to be teaching patients about falls risk within the home. Um, and that could be led using a health professional. It could be modified for residential aged care or for a hospital-based setting. Um, and obviously we can um, customise clinical case studies so you can make the story behind the actual game slightly different if you need to. The new technologies are really you know, evolving at an exponential rate and they're very much based around detection and prevention of falls. But it brings its own challenges and we need to bring both patients and staff along with us if it wants to be successful. But if we can only get people to turn the light on, then I'd be happy. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Does anybody have any questions from the room? No?
any questions uh, from video conference? No? Uh, I do. Okay. Where can we get those walking sticks? Which ones? <laughs> the gun one or what? The whiz bang ones. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, actually, selling them here? I actually have not seen one in Perth. I've seen a sword stick that yeah. one of my patients had, but I have not seen one of those. I'll actually will go and check it. I will see and see if they've actually got the ones with the radio. I mean, actually, that's actually quite clever with the magnet on the handle, so you can pick up the keys. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's but you know, they were actually designed in Britain. Okay. It was a British design, so you need to sort of pick one up when you were there. I should have done, shouldn't I? Have brought, yes. it, brought it back over with me. I do think it's amazing what people think of and then you know are able to put teeth to practice. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much, Tony, because I will say Tony spent last week of his leave putting that whole presentation together, and it would have taken a very long time. So thank you very much, Tony. For